everyone, and welcome back to the It's Good to Talk podcast. So I am joined by uh, Paul. Some of you may um, recognize him if you subscribe to um, another one of my podcasts, the one that I don't upload on enough. But yeah, yeah if you do, uh, the few that are on there, yeah, and you might recognize Paul from that as well, because he is a former um, self defense student of mine. But um, we're going to be talking about um, Paul's uh, recent diagnosis, his journey with mental health, and kind of everything in between. So how are you doing, Paul? All right, recovering from the surgery, so my affect is a little low right now, and I'm a little all over the place. But I mean, this podcast terrible. is this podcast is pretty much known as being all over the fucking place anyway, so it fits. Um, so, <laughs> so like I say, there's a few different things um, with uh, with with mental health that that you've um, kind of gone through. Obviously, there's you've got recent diagnoses, you've got much older diagnoses. Um, I think for a lot of us that, that, that suffer mental health, that's kind of a similar case that, um, I mean, even, even for me, I've had more recent ones, but they seem to be spread out. It's not like they go, you know what, we should test you for basically everything. Uh, which they kind of could if they just asked the right questions. Um, but they just want to go, oh, you've got this. We'll wait five to 10 years until we chest you for anything else. Oh, yeah, you might have this as well. Like, I remember at university for dyslexia is when I finally, at university, I got diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a far worse, if you actually understand obsessive compulsive disorder, far worse mental health issue than fucking dyslexia. Um but they diagnosed me with that at nine years old. They diagnosed me with dyslexia at fucking 19. What? Um, <laughs> but, but there we go. Apparently, uh, apparently they don't like to do that. So you've got some things that you're just kind of coming to terms with now, like ADHD, um, things like that. Um, but obviously you, uh, you have got anxiety and depression that goes back a bit further. So uh, do you want to kind of tell us about like things that have affected you, when they've affected you, the kind of diagnoses that you've had and, you know, what are your wonderful letters? Because myself and most people watching, I'm sure, have a wonderful alphabet of letters that they've been prescribed with or not prescribed. So, yeah, I, I recently, at, like in my mid-20s, just this year, I got diagnosed with ADHD, predominantly inattentive. And um, I was previously di diagnosed with anxiety and depression at different points um, across my childhood and teenage years. And uh, I was also diagnosed with PTSD. I think that was earlier this year as well. Um, I've been kind of spotty about therapy, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, so all the wonderful letters across the years. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, as a, as a kid, I had pretty obvious, in my opinion, traits of ADHD. I was really, really inattentive um, all the time in school. Uh, I struggled to um, do a lot of things um, effectively, and I would, you know, zone out when people were talking to me. And meanwhile, I'd end up focusing nonstop on things that I was interested in um, for way longer periods of time than most kids ever could. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so and then you know, anxiety, general generalized anxiety disorder, uh, depression. Um, since I was like, nine or ten, and then depression, really, especially throughout my teenage years, starting at like twelve or thirteen. Yeah, yeah fun times. Definitely fun times. It does seem to be um, an interesting mix. I mean, I so I was um, prescribed with um, OCD, which is anxiety, at nine, and then depression at fifteen. It does feel like they just go hey, oh, you're anxious. Well, you're only anxious as a kid. And when you're a teenager, you're angsty. So, but you should just be anxious. We're gonna, you've got depression now. And so probably had that before as well, but, you know, we don't, we, we don't want to do that. It is weird. And it's, and it's interesting, especially with the ADHD as well, because I think, so ADHD is, is both over and under diagnosed. It's one of the weirdest ones because it's massively overdiagnosed in kids and underdiagnosed in adults. Like there's so many people that get diagnosed as kids who probably shouldn't be. And so many people that haven't been diagnosed as adults who should be. And it, it's it's such a weird one because it, it does feel like um, with, with diagnosis, they're just gonna go, well, you're this age. So therefore that's a tick there. Okay. It's like, well, the age, yes, there's developmental changes in your brain at different times and everything else, but 
it does feel like too much of a tick list. Um, and the, I mean, the the DSM, the dreaded DSM that is, anyone that uses that in the UK, you shouldn't be for a start um, because it's not our, it's not our book. But the DSM is is just a tick book. And I mean, all of them are. And it, it is horrible that that becomes a thing because then you have to just seemingly know whether the um, the person doing the test is uh, is having a good day or not as to what kind of tick you're going to get. It's a really weird one. Um, so, I mean, what what kind of came out of these for you um, with with getting these diagnoses at different ages? Because, like you say, you've got the you've got you know diagnosed now. You diagnosed when you're like twelve, thirteen. Diagnosed as a kid. Like, did anything come out of them, or was it just the case of you know, they needed to say you had something, which I think is what a lot of people think ADHD has become. So more recent ones, uh, ADHD and PTSD have been helpful to know about. Um, they weren't entirely surprising because I suspected them ahead of time due to, you know, the traits of each of them just being mm. kind of persistent um, for me. But um when I was a kid, the anxiety was something that was diagnosed because it was just really in the face of my parents. Uh, there was no way they could ignore it. Um, I would be, I would have panic attacks and anxiety attacks, um, which there is a distinction, um, as we just covered in a previous podcast. Yes. Uh, I would have both of those throughout my first 10 years of life in particular. I don't really have panic attacks anymore, but I do have anxiety attacks. And those anxiety attacks, um, they couldn't really ignore because they were persistent and teachers would notice them and they'd talk about them and stuff. So they did get me treatment for that. And uh, the treatment was decently effective, but it was pretty medication based. There was not really much therapy involved. So once I stopped medication, um, for what, whatever reason, um, in my early teens, they pulled me off of it. Then the anxiety came back in full force. And that was kind of a defining aspect of my um, inner life for the next, you know, ever, basically. Mm. Uh, as for ADHD and PTSD, learning about that stuff has um, helped explain some of the behaviors that I have just uh, displayed over my lifetime um, and helped me understand the way that I process things and work on things. Um, particularly the ADHD diagnosis was valuable to me because I've been told my entire life that I was lazy and unmotivated because I would struggle in school with attention um, and purpose. Mm. And so now as an adult, I know that, you know, I just, I just work differently um, and that it wasn't, isn't that I'm any of those things and I just need to adjust how I go about things. Yeah, it's it, it it's it's interesting there. I mean I, as as Paul just said there as well, there is a difference in anxiety and um panic attacks. We've just been on a, a, a different podcast together. I, I will very quickly just um do that just so people know as well. So basically panic attacks, you think you're about to die, it's um shallow breath that you can't catch your breath and um a feeling of com you just you you can't breathe doesn't matter what anyone's gonna tell you to calm down which anybody that says calm down someone have a panic attack please go and fuck off um it's uh also don't don't breathe into a paper bag you're poisoning yourself with carbon dioxide and making yourself pass out don't do that um it, so uh, it, basically it's the one that feels more to a lot of people like a heart attack like you are literally about to die um, you can have pains in your chest because of musculoskeletal pain because of your breathing has caused that. A lot of other things that have come to that and they only last a few minutes. Anxiety attacks can last for days. There is a general feeling of dread that you simply cannot get rid of. There is still a potential shallow breath, but it's not one that is in your face to the moment you can't breathe. It simply just feels uneasy in your breathing and it's continuous and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you just have to go on about your day whilst having a continuous feeling of dread, like, you know, the sort of Democles above your head, because you don't really know what's going to happen. That's... Which is plenty of fun when you've got comorbid depression, by the way, as I'm sure many people listening to this are well aware. 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, mean, it's, it's, I, I have more anxiety attacks now. I used to have panic attacks when I was a kid. Don't have panic attacks anymore. Do you have anxiety attacks? I'm kind of more, more depression. It's fun. Um, it's, <laughs> but but came over with a chiller. Also, <laughs> add OCD in there with intrusive thoughts. And by the way, anyone are, are wondering, yes, there's a fucking difference between intrusive thoughts and impulsive thoughts. That shit you see on TikTok, they're impulsive thoughts. That's not intrusive thoughts. Look it up. They're horrible. Add that in, gets real fun. Anyway, um, <laughs> so... You, you mentioned there a couple of times about they put me on this drug, they put me on this drug. Do you, I've, I've always someone that said that there's nothing wrong with being put onto the certain medication because medications can be very helpful for some people. For some people, they simply wouldn't function without them. But um, I'm also of the opinion it should kind of be a three pronged attack. It should be a mix of um, therapy, whatever that therapy is. That doesn't mean talking therapy, but therapy of some kind. You know, that could be D&D game. You know, anyone that's wondering up for mental health go and check out the website it's a charity in the uk and we talk about that um but you, you can have that or it can be that you're doing a specific exercise because you find that that helps you with a bolstering of serotonin or or, or whatever it is um as well as then medication potentially so do you find that they've that you've just been thrown on medication or were you given alternatives the yeah. Majority of my life, I've only been really given medication. Right. And that honestly would be a misleading statement because for most of my life, I haven't been in therapy. Right. Um, but throughout the points where I have been, it's pretty much just been medication, especially when I was really young. It's, I don't know if it's that they didn't have anyone available or that they didn't care to actually sit down for like talking therapy or CBT or anything like that. Yeah. But, um, but well, most of fantastic. most of the anxiety stuff was definitely medicated away, and to an extent that worked. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, putting a kid on medication immediately seems the worst time you should do it. Teenage, exactly. fair enough. And I mean, if you've got depression, I can absolutely understand that. If it's if it's a uh, the the suicidal uh, suicidal ideation, okay, we need a quick fix whilst we try and find you a therapist, maybe. Right. Um, because shit. Um, I can yeah. understand that, but uh, yeah, I um, I think when it when it comes to really really small kids, especially if it's something like anxiety, I'm not the biggest a fan of CBT, but at least it can do something for to help at that point. Especially if you've got groups, you've got kids, it's it seems the the better point. And it does feel like something that's that kind of needs to be pushed back on quite a lot because meds are helpful. Absolutely, I've said it myself, but not for everyone. I've been on meds at different times of my life i went into an exam for my gcse's which anyone outside the uk 16 year old when you finish school although it's changed now because i'm old but 16 years old when you finish school you have gcse's um, which is your general certificate of secondary education um it's what what you have before you then go on to further education and then higher education and um i was on medication for depression at the time and i was not on the right medication because i went into my maths exam by I would explain at this point, I am in the highest set for math uh, that, at that time and uh, generally collected, uh, corrected the teacher quite a lot. And I have been a teacher, taught maths and been a tutor in mathematics since I did not understand what the number two was. That's what my dosage was like at 50, at, what, 16 at the time. Um, and it's like, OK, yeah, I'm feeling great and happy, but I have no idea what the fuck is going on. Um, I, I had to, I, I ended up putting my, like the only exam that I felt I didn't need to actually think about or didn't need to completely fucking, you know, come out of to understand was art. Because I effectively just drew around the the funny images in my head. Um, so <laughs> I think, yeah, meds can be double-edged sword. They're also, I mean, they should have been trying to identify what the cause of your depression was, what the cause of your anxiety was, because of course until you do that you don't know whether meds are even fucking helpful because meds are only yeah. helpful if there's a deficiency if there's not a deficiency and it's something else a tra traumatic event which you've said about ptsd maybe there's something else to address <laughs> they did not end up medicating me for depression okay. when i was a teenager at least not to my memory it may have once but i honestly it's been long enough i don't recall they did don't remember because they're long <laughs> 
but I, I definitely did have a lot of trauma going on that was a cause of the depression and um, the lasting effects of that are what I deal with now, largely. Mm -hmm. um, combined with the dread that you get from anxiety and the, the self-doubt and everything else that, that comes with um, perpetually being in that heightened state of kind of like a, a fear reaction. Um, I had a very, very narcissistic mother and i don't mean in the casual you know um yeah. colloquial sense this was someone who was almost certainly an undiagnosed narcissist um and both of my parents were alcoholics very badly so um and as a result of that there was no safety at home and there was no guidance no reinforcement for any uh like school help that I needed there was there was no no resources available for um for me and my brother and that would be probably the main cause of my depression was that environmental effect and that obviously wasn't going to get addressed because my parents were the ones in control of everything they were the ones who could send me to therapy and could pay for it stuff hmm. it was a very brief year where they did go to therapy because their marriage was falling apart such that the counselor that they were going to ended up bringing us me and my, my sibling in um to talk about our experiences and that was kind of the extent of the therapy i got for what was going on at home um mm -hmm. and therefore the extent of my my therapy for depression basically yeah i mean uh, did you find did, have you found sorry that, um the because it's not something I've really, I've really thought of before, but now, you, now you've mentioned both parents. Have you ever been worried about potential for hereditary alcoholism? Because um, I know some people have talked about that and things like that, because you, I mean, let me preface this, anybody out there, he is not an alcoholic, to my knowledge, but you do drink. That's what no. I, was, I said it like that, because I was like, I don't want it to sound like, oh, you drink a shitload. I just mean, I yeah, have no, myself no. bought you a drink. So it like yeah you know so to, to answer that I I do not drink I don't it, it's not like a uh, the ontological rule I I do drink on occasion yeah and on occasion I mean like maybe once or twice three times a year yeah and when I do it's like a shot yeah maybe half of a beer I rarely even finish the drinks that I do get and it's because. You know, maybe I've just gone, I've traveled to England and I'm, I'm meeting with you again after a while and we're just catching up. So we get a, you, you buy a beer or I buy a beer because, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's the extent of it. And wow. um, maybe if I have like a celebration or something, it's a really, really important thing, then I'll humor somebody. But even then, it's it's rare. I don't even remember the last time I had a drink at this point. So is that a very so, clear distinction for you? Have you done that because of that? Or is it just kind of, oh, I don't need drink? Like, um, I've done it for a few reasons. So first and foremost, yeah, my, my parents, I don't ever want to end up in that position. I don't want to even toy with yeah. the possibility that I could end up an alcoholic. So I just stay away from it. Mm. Second reason, um, it's just not fucking healthy. For you <laughs> it's just not good for you <laughs> so um, <laughs> um I, but yeah i i think it's interesting having that um having that point where you have actually gone no i i need to i need to to think about this beforehand because i think a lot of people and that's why the, the cycle continues a lot of people simply go well you know my parents are alcoholics they drink fuck it i'm gonna have a drink because fuck them or fuck me you know whatever so i think it's it's quite a good idea to like it may be that if you could drink every day of your life and actually not be an alcoholic but it's it's probably a good idea to you know to, to understand yeah. you know it's different and i know that i have a somewhat addictive personality so to speak and um i know that at least as far as my understanding goes with adhd now that i know that i have that um stimulation can um result the way that we perceive stimulation is, is somewhat different. And so as a result of that, I I would worry that there would be a different level of interaction between 
my system and alcohol or weed or you know anything else mm. and so even even though my parents have never to my knowledge smoked any weed or uh even any edibles or anything like that in their life um i stay away from things like that because even though weed is not chemically addictive so much um as alcohol uh it anything can be psychologically addicting um, or you can get psychologically addicted to anything rather um yeah if you're if you're and, not predisposed to that it's it's definitely yeah yeah and so i stay away from that because between the anxiety and depression the adhd and everything I, I just don't want to risk it it's not worth it yeah i mean that's that expensive makes... Everything's expensive in America. I mean, I, I mean, the funniest thing to me was still the last time you guys were here, you and your partner, and said to me that you thought you'd found the cheapest um, supermarket. And it's fucking Waitrose. Anyone out there in? in um, no, 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 no. This was Waitrose. It was definitely Waitrose. That was you saying it. No, I you saying that, it. Or it was that, me. Or, that, or it was Matrix. That might have been. That might have been, been your partner. Yeah, yeah. Before, but okay, that was yeah, not me. You... I'm not going to stand for that criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I said it was you guys are over here, but yeah, it was, it was the fact that like either of you, even though first time out there, but it, it's a kind of a point about the the pricing is, is hilarious. That for anyone in in uh, in America, um, Waitrose to us is like Publix to you guys. Um, like it's like what? Publix. Okay, that's just the South. That's um that's just let me like, let me let me uh let me explain this one. It's more like um more like Target. Target is a bit more expensive. Because no, Waitrose is the most expensive. It's not the bit more expensive. It, mm. it's because Target I see as Sainsbury's. Um Waitrose is like yeah, the that's most probably. expensive. <laughs> like anything you have in your local area in America, because you have a lot of local stores. The most expensive one you can go to, if you're in Florida, you know what public yeah. is. Whatever the most expensive one is, it's that one. I could drop um, another one, but I don't want to give off my location. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, whatever the most expensive store is by you, Whole Foods. It's like a Whole Foods, because that's seemingly across the country. It's like a Whole Foods. So it's so funny having that. Of like, oh, yeah, it's a cheap shop. No, it fucking isn't. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it is it is interesting because I think especially weed that's something that's uh misunderstood a lot about its addictive uh, addictive qualities is it isn't addictive i don't give a shit what people are saying it's not addictive it doesn't have that in it unless of course you are somebody with uh something like adhd or de or depression or anything that's that it can boost the serotonin or the dopamine more like the dopamine but if it can boost that and that's a happy hormone for your brain to go hey last time you did this and so that's it, the psychological addictiveness is a very, very different thing yeah. that I think a lot of people don't understand when it comes to anything, really. Um, and, and I think that's also the case with a lot of medication is why we have medication issues in a lot of places, because people don't understand that even though this drug may not be addictive, it's a psychological addictiveness. I think you get that a lot with, um, yeah. with painkillers, for instance, you, you do have that. So um, the dependency issue is, is where it really comes into play. Mm, yeah. And weed is not something you could become dependent on at least chemically i mean physiologically yeah. like if you if you cold turkey alcohol yeah you could end up dying from that that's not going to happen with with weed yeah it's 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 uh it's a strange one and, and it explains i think the um the pain meds um thing because the reason you have people that are addicted to pain meds is because there's a psychological need for it uh, whereas mm -hmm. it's not necessarily something else um so obviously you've you've kind of felt that and you you've needed to, to to do that for your own kind of health in general have did you find yourself doing certain things when you were a kid to basically try and curb stuff yourself before you even got diagnoses so for instance before you got diagnosed with depression did were you doing stuff to try and and kind of not get to that worst place and the same with like ADHD and everything else worst place as in like so things like, that I was doing to, uh, to like reduce the symptoms I was having. Or, yeah, or basically, were you doing anything to anything to stop yourself? Because I mean, I mean, for anyone that that that, that ha suffers from a specific thing, you have your good and bad days. Were you doing anything to try and make sure or to try and help you not get to one of those bad days? Yeah. So uh, it wasn't wasn't super deliberate or anything, but um, I did find that as a kid. I would distract myself or occupy my my brain with art and with writing quite a bit. Um, and then eventually I, I got my I got a GameCube 
when I was a kid, a Nintendo GameCube. And the stimulation from that was also, you know, really helpful. The, the dopamine from playing a game mm. uh, would give me, a, I guess, an elation that I didn't get at an otherwise, like, really emotionally repressed household. Um, and so I would escape into that. And then later on, I would uh, end up playing online games and I met made friends there and so in addition to the actual game i would find that um you know i could get some community and friendship out of and meaning out of the people that i played with online i still know a lot of them to this day and i think that without them i may have had a much much worse time growing up um and uh those all combined to help me deal with the various challenges that are presented by anxiety and depression in particular yeah i think uh, the online yeah. world definitely has helped a lot of people I, th I think it often gets it often gets a kind of this this bad rap as oh it's online it's not real and it's like well for people that are suffering it's but what it is fucking real i mean they're there they may not be the person but they they exist um but also for people that are suffering it's probably the only thing that's real at all to them like for, for I mean, I'm not a gamer, but I am habitually online. Like I am I am someone who creates and curates a lot of stuff on online from script writing to voiceover to um hosting to um editing to everything else. And I meet people through that. I used to be a streamer, and you do meet people through that, and they're real and they can be the only reason that you stay there and it's i think it's something that's definitely misunderstood the therapy of definitely the case for me. yeah i think the therapy in the that kind of exists within the online space is way bigger than people realize um for for a lot of people yeah i i ended up getting a um i think it was an xbox 360 when i was a uh, teenager and mm. I've ended up making friends on there that I still have to this day. And because of the community that I had online, um, I survived a lot of the trauma that I was going through back then. And I think that without that, I would have felt much more alone. And I honestly don't know that I've actually made it through. And I, again, I still know a lot of those people today. I, I've seen this particular group of online friends. I've seen them only once in person, mm. but I've known them for 13 years. And I'd have seen them more, but you know, we're all, we started being friends when we were all very young. So, you know, money is still an issue and the U S is big and infrastructure is terrible. So, but You'll get um, cheap out there. yeah, it's, it, it is, it is, um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I quit gaming if you call it that back then um before internet <laughs> connection to gaming systems i seem to remember you uh telling me you have a problem with control sticks or something yeah i like fucking that. hate them i i hate analog <laughs> i hate analog control uh, fuck off just that's the direction you want me to go in point the camera there and just let me do up and down I, but that's why i've come back to gaming like two years ago because of uh, because of um pc gaming a mouse and a keyboard. Fuck, things can be done like this. So much better for me. So much better. Um, but I mean, I quit gaming just off when the analog gaming, uh, uh, analog controllers came into the PlayStation, the original PlayStation. So what's that, 1995 that happened? Because 94 was the release. So 95, I stopped gaming. Because I had an original, okay, yeah. I had an original NES um, before the SNES, because there was one. And I had a, I had the, um, before that, I played Pong. On the original system for pong as well so uh, like i i i i quit before that became a thing because that came in what the playstation 2 like the next iteration it was an online thing um so i never i ma never managed to get that but i like i say i still found online to be very helpful at certain times like when you need when you need voices in the background that aren't yours i think it can be very helpful because unfortunately if you're suffering from suicidal ideation or anything like that the voices in the background aren't necessarily ones you want to listen to. So that makes me think of something. Um, I think a lot of people understand this who are on the younger end of the spectrum. And I would extend this up to um, millennials largely as well, of course, is that for a lot of kids, 
if you find that um, you can you can make a community of friends online for a parent of of this particular kid, they need to be aware that if they're intending to punish their kid or something, let's say they're not doing their homework enough and they want to threaten that they'll take away their video game console or something like that, they need to be aware that it's it's no longer just you're taking away, and, and for some people it is, but for a lot of people, you're you're threatening you're threatening to take away more than just you know the actual game that they're playing. You're threatening to take away their social group and their support group, their therapy. Yeah, their support group. And that was how it was for me. My parents would regularly threaten to take that from me because when I was a kid and I had ADHD and I was struggling to keep up with school for one reason or another, um, they would threaten me with taking away my my video games when I was a kid. And I didn't care about the games at that point. Like, you know, the games were fun and they were, but, but they were just the medium through which we would interact. Yeah. And we would have, you know, very long conversations just hanging out. And my, my parents didn't understand that for a long time when I was a kid. And I don't know that they ever really did understand it fully. Yeah. I suppose it's so just... a lot of parents take that from their kids and it's really yeah. bad for them. It's about knowing. It's about knowing your your kid at the end of the day. Which parents? Yeah. Let's be honest. A lot of them just don't. Um, because yeah. there, there are ways of still doing that. If you think, okay, you want to punish them by taking the game away, okay, but don't take away Discord, for instance, or don't take away right. Twitch, because it might be that they can still talk to the people, so they can still have a support group. They're yeah. just not having that bit. So if you want to punish them, you can take away the game, but don't take away the support group that goes with it. And there are ways of yeah. doing. It. Now, granted, when you were younger, Discord didn't really exist. Twitch didn't really exist. So it wasn't as you didn't have those other places right. you could go. It was only really through the lobbies that you could talk to people. But the thing it, about it, some understanding. Thinking about it from when I was a kid, I if they if they'd taken the discs away, for example, that mm. could have perhaps done that. But then there's like the digital downloads of games. So now, if someone doesn't have a PC, if a kid doesn't, teenager or whatever doesn't have a the gaming PC. Mm. Um, I mean, actually, it doesn't really matter if it's a PC or a console. Either way, a lot of the stuff is digital now, so you can't really take away only the games as as easily um, while leaving Discord and such intact. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess do that if they have a phone or something. But yeah, you know. I guess the thinking the thinking for me is they could, if they had access to your Steam. Or if they, you know, or if they, um, if you, it was just for a console and they just took mm -hmm. that away because you weren't a PC gamer, you were just a console game, take the console away and then be like, right, you're now, you're also banned for PC. Like, I think there's, there's just, basically it's, you've actually got to understand your child to know what is yeah. punishment and what is abuse because exactly. <laughs> at the end of the day, it may not seem like it because there's plenty of people. I'm sure there's people that are watching this going, it's not abuse doing that. When I was a kid, yeah, you're not a fucking kid anymore. And that was a long time ago. In the same way, happen, the stuff, mean it was all right. Exactly. And also the same stuff that, that would have been damaging to you isn't the same that would be damaging to me or to Paul or to the next generation. Because yeah. you know, I'm an elder. I mean, I, I will always call it that elder millennial, not older. I'm an elder. I'm an elder millennial. Like I'm, I'm in that, that cusp that's just before or just after, sorry, um, Gen X. And, but I, I have, um, uh, you know, because I was a teacher and because of being in university, I'm um, a little bit later. I know Gen, uh, I know Gen Z and I was on Twitch. So I, I can sympathize with both sides of it. And just because something didn't seem bad to you, doesn't seem, it doesn't say it wasn't bad for people before. The one that I always see all the fucking time is uh, on Facebook because, you know, it's Facebook, is the one where it compares someone going to the Battle of the Somme with um, like a, a, a teenager nowadays um, playing on games or whatever and look, going, oh God, you know, it's like, yes, but the people who went to Battle of the Somme had fucking PTSD that pretty much killed them for the rest of their life. Your granddad that sat in the corner that never spoke about anything, just drank. Maybe there was something fucking wrong. The only difference now is that people, children, are told to tell you about it, and then yeah. you punish them because they've told you, and they actually like that's not the way shit works. <laughs> it's that's it's yeah. You uh, you seen Godzilla minus one yet? Godzilla minus one. The mm -hmm. fuck is that? 
It's a movie that came out last year. It was extremely good. Okay. Um, but I bring it up because one of the, the concepts, themes in that movie that's talked about pretty extensively is um, like it doesn't, having gone to war does not make you great and having not gone to war is ideal. Like you, you shouldn't be shaming someone for having not gone to war. The whole thing takes place during the 50s, like right after um, the end of the war um, or in the years following. And um, there's this, not spoiling anything here, but uh, there's a guy who ends up, he's a young man ends up talking to a couple of veterans and he wants to go help, you know, fight Godzilla or whatever. And yeah. The two men he's talking to are older men and they're, they're veterans and they're like, no, we need, we want to leave you a future. It does not make you great um, to have been in war. I mean, it's not. Yeah. It it doesn't make you not great either. I get, I get what you it, mean. You know. But, I mean, weirdly enough, the obvious person to mention there would be Muhammad Ali, literally coined the greatest, who went to prison because of his beliefs, um, not wanting to fight in the Vietnam War. Yeah. Still, literally great. Uh, you know, the ideal is that people don't have to. Go to war and fight exactly, yeah, and yeah. And, you know, yeah. Uh, it's such a to... weird thing that it's seen as such. It's it's an alpha male bullshit thing. But and by the way, anyone out there, um, if you have a brain cell, um, which if you call yourself an alpha male, yeah, um, that study, uh, done by the person that you're getting your idea of an alpha male from, was also rescinded by the same person. Uh, about three years later, he actually wrote another book and tried desperately to have the original book um, taken off of shelves because he realised that his complete study was absolutely wrong and the alpha male actually led from the back because it was the older one making sure that nothing attacked. And the person at the front, the wolf at the front, which is where it comes from, was actually the brash one that was more likely to get killed. So just think about that when you're being a dick online. Um, but... <laughs> so... The other thing I find funny is how usually the people who uh, who kind of worship this idea of going to combat and stuff like that, and that everyone today is weak because X or Y, hmm. they tend to be uh, of the baby boomer generation. And most of them, at least here, had a much easier childhood than we do uh, hmm. in terms of... Uh, like economic conditions and such. A lot of them didn't go to war. I mean, to my... No, they, they didn't yeah. at all. They were children the last time no. the draft was happening. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is a, it's, when you don't have to go to war, it's really easy to say how brilliant it was. And that's kind of the point of PTSD as well. And that's what I mean is that, you know, we forget that people in the past had mental health issues because I think that's why a lot of it gets thrown under the rug now is we treat it as if these things are new. They're not new. It's just that we've grown up in a society that one, doesn't like the fact that it exists, is shit about it, but also wants you to talk about it because, you know, um, and so that's why you hear about it now. It doesn't mean it didn't exist before. It simply is talked about more now. That's, you know, people, people have always been left-handed. But we didn't used to talk about it. It's a wonderful thing. There's there's a graph that you can find about. Um, it, it talks about people that are um of different sexual orientations as well against a graph of people that are left-handed, and you notice that oh well, people that are you know bi or gay, whatever, that's gone up since since we've allowed it. And it's like yeah, same thing happened with left-handed people. The second we we allowed people to be left-handed, which they've always fucking been left-handed, suddenly. The cases, the cases of left-handedness went up. Yeah, because they before, didn't suddenly become that way. They just no, admitted it. They just got beaten. The they last just time they weren't allowed to say yeah. that that's because the last they time they said they were left-handed and, and they were a Catholic co convent or something, they got the shit kicked out of them because apparently that's the devil's hand. So you know, um, <laughs> it's it's it's, a, it's just such a weird thing that 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 we don't we don't. Um, we don't recognize enough the the online and different therapies. And again, it's why I, you know why I created the, the upper mental health thing because I think it is important that we recognize that different therapies are important. You know, and that can include online gaming. That can include board gaming. Which, damn it, that's the one I enjoy more. Um, <laughs> and now on on that topic, actually, yeah, one of the ways that I think I survived as a kid, um, I created a kind of D and D adjacent. Uh, like live action role play slash in video games role play 
like my brother and I played when we were kids, mm. uh, had like a prolonged narrative that ended up lasting literally for years. Mm. And it was a really good creative outlet. And I think that things like that, DMD, et cetera, um, are actually a pretty substantial um, method of therapy that I, I think kind of goes like, you know, people don't think of it that way. You know, depending on what you're going through, it can really, it really can be helpful in addition to the creativity and outlet that it is, the community and the, the interaction that you get from it is good, even if it's just with your sibling. Yeah. I mean, definitely, it definitely helps creativity for a start. Um, I still have a character I have never played because I was meant to do a D&D um, &D session, but something came up, so I didn't do it. So I have an unplayed level one um, fighter um, <laughs> it's called Iskapo that I've never played. I still have the game. I still have the um, the, the sheets in my uh, on a USB drive somewhere. I've never still never played D and D. Although I, I part of me thinks I wouldn't necessarily be that good at it because seeing things in my mind and playing stuff out, I actually don't like. But anyway, um, but yeah, it, it is important that we recognise these things as therapy that that they can be very helpful for different people because if you if the world in which you live tells you you're lazy, you're shit, you're just, you know, your your brother's better, your sister's better, your, whatever it is, then do you want that person to be creative in a world that they can see or just simply not be in the world at all? Because there's a difference. And if we don't recognize it as a therapy, the difference is that you lose that person. So I think that that can be really, really, really important for a lot of things. Um, so, I mean, again, back, back to the kind of things for you. Have you found that you found more um, kind of creative things to do and or recognize them since your diagnosis with ADHD? Because that's only been very recent, the past few months. So have you found that you've kind of gone, OK, so this is now part of it and it's been more encompassing or was it the case that because of things like D&D, &D, you were just always doing this stuff anyway, it's just now in line with everything? A little bit of both, um, for sure. Uh, since I learned that I have ADHD, I've been a little bit more forgiving of my kind of sporadic attention um, span that I previously was kind of trying to force to work uh, in a way that I think neurotypical people would more often be able to do. So I was like, you know, for a while I would try to, write out like a, a list of these are all the things I'm going to do and I will do these things. Hmm. And it would be unrealistic to expect certain amounts or certain types of activity or tasks to be completed um, because I just wasn't accounting for like, maybe I, I hyperfixate on one thing so I can get one really complicated task done that day that could take me hours and hours. But, you know, if I try to do a bunch of little tasks that ultimately are less work, because of the way that I am, I just, I can't get all of them done, even though they are ultimately less work volume, because I just can't keep myself focused from one thing to the next. I end up scattered or, you know, I find like a little detail of one thing that I'm doing and it leads me to think, oh, I, I need to do this other adjacent related thing. And so then you end up creating subtasks for yourself. And by the end of the day, you've either gotten like virtually nothing done that you had planned but you got other things done mm. and therefore kind of negated the whole purpose of planning in the first place or you find that you've just created more tasks for yourself um but for me i've uh been adjusting since i learned that i have adhd uh in order to kind of lay out a more realistic set of tasks for myself to complete um mm. whether it's during the week or a given day and um, that's been really, really helpful to me. And it, it also um, has allowed me to choose the types of tasks uh, and go about them more effectively. Yeah. I think that the important thing you said there is kind of giving yourself a, a break. Um, I often say to people that there's no point in forgiving your the past you because that's not you anymore forgiving or at least giving a break to the person you are now because of things that you cannot control I think is important and that's not to say that you get a free pass if you suffer from mental health issues it's to say that there can be little quirks that you have you kind of go okay so 
beating myself up for that isn't going to help. It's not going to change it. Being nice to myself isn't going to change it, whatever. But it will mean that I don't beat myself up even more and make cause other pro issues because then yeah. the anxiety comes in, the depression comes in because you're just constantly beating yourself up. And I, yeah. I think it's an important thing. It is an important distinction as well. I don't agree with forgiving your past um, because it's pointless. I do think you should forgive and give um, a um, a break to your present. And I'm I'm very quickly going to explain as to why I don't agree with giving uh, to um, forgiving your past. The re the reason I don't see a point to forgiving your past is because if you are truly a different person and that person actually needs or wants forgiveness, then why are you forgiving somebody else? Because you're not that person anymore. So you're forgiving somebody else's misdeeds. Um, that doesn't help anybody because you're not that person. Anybody that you are bad to, whatever to, they're not going to care if you have grown because you're a dick to them. They're not going to care about it. They're not going to care if you feel better. Um, all it does is actually force you to have to relive parts of you that you have shed since you were that person. You drop so, an anchor in the past. Yeah. And the past is immaterial. Exactly. So forgiving your past how about forgive and give time for yourself now before that past becomes one that you feel you need to forgive because that's what's important acknowledge um, one and move on yeah acknowledge understand um and make good from what you are now rather yeah. than allow to boil on do nothing and then feel you have to forgive it because it's pointless at that point it's gone um you know so um yeah it's i think it's it's definitely an important thing and like you say you've been able to kind of curate your days now and your activities around understanding it so i mean would you have any anything to kind of say for anyone that's unsure about whether they want to be diagnosed because you can see it on tiktok and everything all the time i mean i and i've come across people and people don't want to get diagnosed for a number of different reasons some people don't want to get diagnosed because you know well i've i've decided i have it already therefore it doesn't matter yeah and you, get, you also get people that are like, well, what's it going to change? What does it matter if I have it? I mean, it's, as someone that's only recently been diagnosed, I mean, what's what's your kind of thought process or any words for them? So I would say that if you're concerned about like stigma or something like that, you don't have to announce it to the world that you have a diagnosis, firstly. If you get diagnosed with ADHD, PTSD, anything else, that can be something that only you know at the end of the day if you want i i would share that with a partner or something if you if you um are with somebody but it's not something that needs to be broadcast you're not collecting pokemon cards to display um but as far as uh what the actual utility of a diagnosis is uh as somebody that has gone um his entire life without a diagnosis up until mid twenties, I wish I had known sooner because it would have allowed me to realize that, or to know, I guess that I was not lazy because I was struggling to accomplish certain tasks or to keep up in school or anything like that. We talked about this uh, a little bit on another podcast, mm -hmm. um, on another channel, but, uh, I I think it's important for people to realize that um, initiation and motivation are two different things. And if you're struggling to, to get started with a task, that doesn't mean that you don't care about it, especially if you have ADHD, because those are two different mechanics of the of the mind. You can care a lot about something or or even see like a an incoming consequence of not doing something. And you can still fail to do it because you, your brain just couldn't set off the, the, um, you know, the ignition on it. And so, that's that's an important aspect of it. And um, knowing that you're diagnosed with something um, means you no longer have to guess as to why your behavior is the way it is. You don't have to wonder like in the back of your mind, like, am I actually just lazy, or mm. you know, am I? Do I just really not? understand people or you know whatever it is whether it's adhd or autism or something else um it, it eliminates some of that guesswork that can then lead to 
shame when you don't know. Um, so I, I think it is important, regardless of how you decide you want to proceed with treatment after the fact, to know for, for sure that this is part of who you are, helps you understand the way that you function and not have to um, doubt yourself on various subjects. Yeah, and that it's the certainty, isn't it? It's the it's the kind of I I know for sure. It's not just in my own mind. It's not just because somebody said something. It's it's the certainty. And as you say, you don't have to tell everyone. You just oh, I've got this. Okay, I've got. Uh, so I need to be sure. I need to be careful of this, this, and this. Okay, my partner should probably know. Hey, this happens. I'm not. You know, I don't not love you anymore, or whatever, whatever I've said because of you know. Your partner uh, will understand, and if they don't, they're then, not just partner. <laughs> yeah, then you shouldn't yeah. be with them. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's that kind of thing, and, and like you say, with uh, with the um, the initiation of things, it's uh, I suppose it's a bit like having a, a car on a hill. You know, it, once once the car is going down the hill, it's hard to stop. But if the handbrake is on at the top, it's not going to fucking start. So it's it's that kind of that kind of thing, really. It's uh, you know. It, it's trying to jumpstart that and whether that's, you know, taken because there's someone else there with you, like a support group to help you take the break off or whether there's a shock from, um, from a, another car, because actually it was just a dead battery with like you'd have with meds, whatever it is, there's, there's something that can then help that to then progress down the hill. So um, was there anything else that you haven't mentioned? I know we've gone all over the place, but that's, kind of the point of the podcast the podcast i've always said to people this is a chat in a pub and especially between neuro two neuro uh typical uh, what the fuck did i just say two neurodivergence um especially uh, that kind of thing a conversation never goes in one direction what the fuck is that um so it always goes all over the place so is there anything that we haven't mentioned you think should have been mentioned or just anything in general that you'd like to kind of say before we we kind of conclude on things um I think anybody listening to this who is either diagnosed or has not been diagnosed yet and is considering whether or not they they might uh, pursue some kind of diagnosis, not like chase after a specific one, but like go in and get checked to see if you might have something. Mm. Um, regardless of where you stand with that, try to try to judge yourself by your own metric. Don't. Um, Take, take what people say into consideration, of course, but don't let them tell you who they who you are. Because for me, I spent most of my life being told that I was lazy. And that's something that I internalized for a really long time and that I still deal with. And you do not have to believe other people when you know that that's not who you are. And especially when you if you do know later that you have ADHD or, or something else that explains some of the behaviors that these people were ultimately talking about, you know, it's, it's just gonna, it's gonna benefit you a lot to kind of live by your own, um, your own assessment of yourself as best you can. Yeah. I think that's, that, that's a good point. It, it's, there's there's the way that the, the world supposedly is, and I think that's the way the neurotypicals kind of want to make everyone. But the fact is, we're not. If you're not a divergent, you are diverse from the crowd. Uh, and mm -hmm. I actually don't think there's a neurotypical that is neurotypical in in sense of what they feel is the absolute norm. That's kind of the point. So yeah, living by a metric of what you understand yourself to be while still being a good person, I think is absolutely right. Um, Thank you so much for being with us, Paul. Anyone that's still with us now, um, that's been with us since the beginning, firstly, go get yourself a cookie. You deserve it. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm not entirely sure who we've got with us uh, next week. We've had to rearrange a little bit because one of the people that we were going to have on um, is um, actually involved with the uh, general election that's going on in the UK, which came out freaking nowhere. So we've had to rearrange that a little bit. Um, we've also, unfortunately, we do have um, a psychiatrist um psychologists uh, from uh australia that has had to rearrange because of personal issues so we, we have a load of stuff but there is stuff yet to come we don't know who's going to be here but whoever it is i'm sure they're going to be amazing so thank you once again paul and thank you all for joining us see you again next time